Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the St. Louis Java Users Group, the June 2021 edition. And let me see if I can get my slide. To, whoops. There we go. So for people who don't know, the St. Louis Java Users Group is an informal uh, group of Java developers, and we get together about once a month. Attendance is free. There's no formal membership list. The normal meeting date is the second Thursday of each month, except December, when there's no meeting. There's just too many things going on over the holidays for us to organize a meeting uh, during the month of December. When we meet in person, normally you can join us for food and social at 6, and then we start the presentation at 6.30. Uh, our last meeting location when we were meeting in person was the Object Computing Incorporated Training Room, and they're located at 12,140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310 in St. Louis. I'd like to introduce the other members of the St. Louis Java Users Group Steering Committee. So from left to right, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Zimmerman, Bruce Allspaw in the middle, that's me, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Zwang. You can reach all of us on the steering committee if you just send an email to that address there at the bottom of your screen. That's javasigsc at ociweb.com. Just send an email there and all of us will get it. The St. Louis Java Users Group would not be possible without the support of our JUG sponsors. So I'd like to thank Object Computing Incorporated. They've been with us since 1997, since the JUG was founded. And they've been helping us out with room arrangements and filling in uh, gaps when they, when they happen. And they've saved the group here numerous times when we uh, need to be able to get something done here at the last minute. They've been good to always step in. JFrog has been a consistent sponsor here, especially after uh, we had to go to uh, remote uh, uh, operation because of the pandemic. They cover the cost of the Zoom subscription uh, for us, so they make this meeting possible remote by covering that. And they also pay the meetup group subscription fees. Now it's free for you to RSVP and to attend a meeting, but it does cost the group uh, some money to be able to have a meetup group on the meetup.com website. When we've been meeting in person, we also have two headhunters that have been supplying food for the meetings and that's Signature Consultants and Adaptive Solutions Group. So if you are uh, looking for a Java position, uh, feel free to reach out to either one of them and let them know that that's how you found out about us was through the Java Users Group. At the end of the meeting, we will be raffling two JetBrains licenses. So they're a sponsor as well. And uh, you must be present to win. Sorry if you're watching the recording, you're, you're too late. And when we do meet in person, uh, Elastic, they're the sponsors of Elastic Search and so forth. They have some gift cards. We haven't figured out yet exactly how to send that, you know, over the internet. But when we're back in person, we'll, we'll bring those back. Intertech is a training company. And they have a lot of online videos and training. And they have been sponsoring, when we meet in person, the famous Screaming Flying Monkeys, as well as mouse pads and coffee cups and the like. Now, the screaming mouse, screaming flying monkeys are little monkey dolls for people who don't know. And if you toss them up against the wall, they scream and hey, they're a lot of fun and quite popular when we have them. Manning has been great. They, they will be uh, sponsoring two uh, ebooks, which we'll include in the raffle tonight at the end of the meeting for those who are still present, must be present to win. And Pearson also sponsors physical books uh, on occasion. So thank you for all of our sponsors. Here's our presentations here that we have in development. So on July 8th, the next meeting will be pouring coffee into the matrix. That's building Java applications on Neo4j. 
So Jennifer Reef, who has presented before, will be presenting on uh, Neo for J and the developments there. We're working this out on August 12th. We're going to be on the Quarkus World Jug Tour. And that's by the speaker will be Christopher Bolin of Red Hat. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to do the swag. Uh, they're going to have t-shirts and all kinds of things. So that should be a really good one. Then September 9, uh, we're approaching the expected release date of Java 17 which is expected to be the next long-term support edition of, of Java. So I was thinking, all right, if we're gonna have a new long-term support edition, maybe we ought to have a presentation on what's new in it. And so Simon Ritter of Azul Systems has agreed that he'll either come to St. Louis or do this remotely to uh, give us a presentation on that. So right now, the way the, uh, Everything is scheduled for our upcoming presentations. The thing to do is to just watch the meetup group. That's meetup.com slash gateway jug for any updates to the presentation schedule and location. So for right now, everything's still set for remote, but we're trying to sort out uh, how we can eventually try to land this plane if we can find a good meeting room. And uh, if anybody has any ideas on that, well, you can just send an email to that address there on your screen, javasigsc at ociweb.com. If you can get us some sponsors here, we'll see uh, what we can do. And if you're interested in giving a presentation or sponsoring the jug, uh, you can contact us through that email address as well. So for tonight's presentation, I, I don't see Ari there, so he may be busy tonight. Uh, We'll go straight then, I guess, to automated mass refactoring for Java-based applications by, uh, by John. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and, uh, and let, you, uh, let you take over, take it away. All right, thanks, Bruce. It's, uh, it's good to be back at uh, Gateway Jug. It's been a couple of years, I think, since, uh, since I last presented and, um, and since then, um, have gone back to uh, a technology that uh, originally worked on at Netflix that uh, that helps to automatically refactor Java applications. So think um, performing API migrations, uh, whole framework migrations like JUnit 4 to 5, Spring Boot 1 to 2, um, patch vulnerable code, clean up code, things like that. Um, We've sort of, uh, so we uh, actually formed a, a company around this last year, uh, decided to, you know, the 2020 was the year apparently to go ahead and, and start something. Uh, and we've uh, really expanded upon the, the capabilities of what's, what's possible. And so I'm excited to share uh, and show you what, what we can do tonight. Um, so to begin with, uh, we'll just, I've only got a few slides and we'll go straight into uh, live coding and hopefully this all works out tonight. But part of what we think, you know, uh, for code, uh, maintainability is its destiny. We, you know, we've all worked on legacy code bases that continue to grow and grow and grow and accrue complexity and things. And uh, increasingly we spend uh, a lot of time on just tedious code maintenance. Um, code maintenance just feels like doing the dishes. You know, sometimes you've got to, uh, just go through and clean things up, and and uh, I've always found it interesting that uh, you know as uh, our our development practices have gotten more and more aligned to the businesses that we work for, the expectation is that we work on value, you know, for the business and not on the the technical aspects of the code, and so we wind up, you know, begging our business to let us do the maintenance. We wind up sort of begging to do the dishes and and, uh, and you know I think for many of us you know they've been coding for a while uh, we're, we're ready to just kind of not do some of these these uh, tedious tasks anymore so I alluded to uh, the origins of the technology we'll show tonight being um, from Netflix and you know the example that got it all started way way back in you know five years ago now in 2016 
um, was the, the platform team at Netflix had, had written a, a custom logging framework early in its life. And it highly resembled SLF4J or what would eventually be SLF4J, but preceded it, you know, and it, SLF4J didn't exist yet. Um, and it looked something like this. You, you actually had a class called Logger and Logger Factory actually, and, uh, in many ways looked very similar to SLF4J, but, but there was some subtle differences. Like uh, in the error uh, logging statement here, um, you, uh, maybe I got these out of order actually, but. Well, I'll just explain it. The original logging error statement here was rather than the brackets, it would have used the percent %s, you know, kind of like string dot format format. Um, and in the Netflix logging framework, the exception came first, and the parameters came last. Um, so to actually make the change to SLF4J, it involved, you know, changing the import from the internal logging library to SLF4J. It involved changing this actual string literal to use the SLF4J style parameterization. And it involved changing the uh, order of the arguments to put the exception last. Which, you know, we attempted to do this through regular expressions and things like that. But of course, if the statement, you know, drifts over multiple lines, that's really complicated. If you wind up having uh, chains of method calls here in the, the parameter list, that gets really complicated. Um, and so it really, it's kind of beyond the scope of what you can do with a you know, regular expression replacement. And I think we've all experienced that kind of thing before. So this is where it was, it was really born. We, we uh, started working on a, a technology that could uh, perform abstract syntax tree modification to um, to actually replace these kinds of things. Now, there were similar technologies that preceded it. Uh, Google has one called Refaster. There's some others out there um, that perform AST manipulations. But you know, many of the examples of prior technologies we saw would, when you printed out the result, would you know print out the AST and and re ultimately reformat all the code which for Google is totally fine. You know, they have a very consistent uh, Java format that they use internally. But for a lot of organizations, including Netflix at the time, um, there just wasn't a consistent style. Um, and so if we were to make a, a change, like, you know, just a logging statement and we clobbered the formatting of the remainder of the source file, you know, developers would hate that. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want to take the change. Um, so when we set out to build this original technology, it was, you know, build it off of an AST manipulation, make sure that AST uh, or abstract syntax tree has type information on it so that we can accurately identify the call sites that we intend to change. And then preserve on that AST, the formatting of the original code so that when we make a change, it's minimally invasive. It looks, you know, really just like a developer had changed the original code. So just kind of a view here of what, you know, the abstract syntax tree is, you know, if you're looking at a, a piece of code, it winds up getting translated into this, this tree that represents the different syntactic structures of the code uh, with type information on it. And imagine all the white space that exists before these things hanging off of each one of these, these tree elements. So that's kind of the like guts of what's going on. Um, but, you know, let's see some, uh, examples now of this um, actually in operation. Um, hopefully you can see this video here. Let me know if you cannot. Um, we're gonna, we've been building upon, you know, we've gone and gone from basic things like, um, like, uh, you know, changing one method uh, to whole framework migrations. So things that are much more complicated uh, building on these basic building blocks. Um, so we'll show an example of where we're gonna take a code base um, and migrate it completely from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5. Um, what we're showing here, um, it, what you, to kind of orient you is um, a, a service, a running service that our company uh, develops to execute these, uh, these open source recipes on a large set of code. Um, so, um, and you know, we'll orient a little bit more to this, but to this specific recipe. Um, the 
the kinds of changes it would make when it's doing a JUnit 4 to 5 migration. We would actually modify the dependencies in the POM uh, in a very contextual way. Um, you know, in this case, we know that we have to add a Hamcrest dependency because, um, because the project uses Hamcrest. Um, you know, we have to add the JUnit 5 dependency, remove the JUnit 4 dependency. Some of these things like, um, like, like here, the original JUnit 4 had an expected uh, exception class argument, but in JUnit 5, that doesn't exist anymore. So the, the approach is to create an assert throws uh, statement, specify what the exception was, and then put the method body inside of a Lambda. Um, so that's the kind of level of change we're able to affect now is to, you know, move whole blocks of code somewhere else and change the annotation. Um, notice that, you know, when we change uh, imports here, that we uh, preserve the original import ordering of the project uh, as, it, as we could see that it existed. Um, you know, it's, uh, if, if we wind up adding an import and that causes the IDE to want to starfold it, we'll starfold the import or unfold it or it's all those little details that you need to do in order to accomplish these kinds of changes. So you know that before returns to before each, the test annotation is different, um, you know, different assertions and, and things like that. Um, and those are the kinds of changes that, that, uh, that we make. So it's kind of a, you can run uh, this recipe on a repository and all at once, um, you know, migrate it from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5 while preserving the original style. Um, so um, part of the, uh, the, the service that we have now as well can take the result and you can say, I just want to take, uh, just create a pull request off of this uh, difference that the, uh, the rewrite technology has developed and it'll create a new branch or create a new fork if necessary, if you decide to want to do that um, and create that new branch so that you can review it and um, you know when you're ready to do that, um, actually submit the pull request. So you see in GitHub, just all the same changes that we were visualizing there. So some of the simpler things like uh, maybe we would wanna use the diamond operator um, from that was originally introduced in Java 7, uh, but you see a lot of code out there, again, legacy code that still doesn't use it uh, uniformly. Um, we're kind of clicking through uh, the recipe catalog here, and see some of the recipes that we've already got written. Um, so we'll run this use diamond operator here. do a, a diff on that you see where you know any place where we're using the specifying the type on the right hand side you can just automatically uh, uh, you know remove that and continue and use the diamond operator as necessary so um, just you know imagine being able to just kind of one shot do this across the whole code base and be done with it you know and not and not see that ever again that's that's kind of the idea uh, so similarly, you know, create a pull request off of this. Uh, you can see, you know, all the diamond operator usages here. Um, so we, we, in addition to Java, we've developed abstract syntax trees for YAML, for XML, for properties, um, adding one for Terraform. We have one for Kubernetes. We have one for Maven. Uh, Maven's AST, it's actually just an extension of the XML AST that contains semantic information about Maven. So when we look at a POM file, we know all the sort of details of its relationships with other things and its dependencies and so forth. And that allows us to do things like dependency analysis across repositories where you may look for, say, I wanna find occurrences of Jackson modules in the compile scope across the whole code base. Um, and it would look at all the POM files across the whole code base and, and show you that, you know, Jackson, Jack's annotations in this case occurred here. It was being pulled in by Jersey Media, Jason Jackson. And of course, you know, this Jackson module, you can't see that by just looking at the XML. Uh, it, you know, it's semantic information 
that we're layering on top of XML to show you where these things exist. Think of it kind of like a Maven dependency tree, only rather than doing it you know, on the command line and then trying to understand where, what the association of that output is to the POM file, it's pointed out to you in line in the POM file where it exists. Um, so that's, uh, that's that bit. I'll actually flip over to a live form of this and we'll see how this goes. Um, I think to, de to demonstrate, um, you know, I th so first of all, um, this, the actual technology uh, to do this, these refactoring operations is here at the open rewrite, uh, rewrite uh, organization on GitHub. And so this contains all the, the refactoring technology we've been seeing. All the recipes that we develop are all Apache licensed and free to use. We also have a uh, rewrite uh, Maven plugin, um, which allows you to uh, apply these rewrite recipes via a, a Maven uh, goal. And we have a rewrite Gradle plugin that allows you to apply these recipes uh, via a Gradle task. So on docs.openrewrite.org, um, you can see if you just look at the, the quick start Maven and Gradle, you can see how to apply these plugins. You know, it's adding the rewrite plugin. And then you can ex you can activate one of the recipes that's included um, and execute it uh, against any given repository and see the results and commit them. So you could do say that J unit four to five migration that we were seeing today, you could just apply the Maven or Gradle plugins and see that uh, that result. But um, we'll flip over. So again, all these recipes are, you know, we can run uh, in the service as well. Um, they're sort of uh, included here. And I think a fun exercise for tonight would be, um, we've all encountered uh, like Google Guava or the Apache Commons libraries. And um, I think we know that uh, it's best if you know, in, in many cases, we just use the Java standard library when possible. Um, a lot of the Guava utilities, like especially in the collections package, um, came from an era before Java, the Java library was improved. And so something like, um, like uh, the, uh, like immutable set dot of can be replaced by just set dot of in Java 9 and above. So I think it'd be fun to actually build the recipes that migrate you from uh, the Guava collections library to uh, just the Java standard library so that you can thin out the dependencies a bit uh, in some of your projects. It's just an example of what it looks like to write one of these. So first of all, I'm not totally sure um, what, um, what methods to target. So let's look for a little bit. Uh, we're going to just do a search recipe here and look for finding methods. Um, so we know that the you know the Google Common like the, all the list methods are under this Google Com Google Common Collect, and there's various types, and there's various method names, and and we'll just uh, we'll we'll say we'll look for any usages of you know a method inside of this package, um, and just run this. Um, so we're running this right now on about 10 million lines of code. Uh, uh, these are just public repositories, common you know, Java repositories on GitHub. Um, and the result is, I think, pretty fast for a, uh, you know, a search across uh, 10 million repositories. We'll, we'll look just at the results for a moment and maybe we'll look at like a CERN repository since that one's not so far from St. Louis anyway. Um, we'll look at one of their repositories and um, notice that we're able to find, you know, usages of Guava's uh, collection library here, in this case, to create a new hash set, uh, in this case, to create a new array list. Um, now this is kind of silly, right? Like uh, you could, it would be silly if you, you brought in Guava into a, a project simply to create a new array list when you could just create a new array list by uh, instantiating an array list. So I think we'll, let's uh, make a note and we'll make that one of the things that we, uh, we try to accomplish today. 
um, let's look a bit more at what else is in the list. Maybe like this Morgan Stanley, this has 143 usages of it, it looks like. Um, here's a good example too, you know, immutable set dot of. Um, I know it's been frustrating for Java developers for a long time that we didn't, there was no way of just creating a set of a couple elements, you know, uh, um, that was convenient to use. You could use uh, collections.singleton a little bit, but, um, you know, it's, uh, there wasn't a good way of creating a set of multiple elements. And in, in Java 9, they introduced uh, set.of. It looks very similar to this, actually. And they created list.of and all the things that we would have expected to have for a while. So it's kind of not necessary to use this anymore. So maybe let's start with this one, this immutable set.of and turn it into set.of so that we can remove this use of Glava throughout the, the library. So I'm gonna come over here to a project and um, to write a rewrite recipe, some things, we've got a lot of basic building blocks like change type, and change method names and change method targets and things like that, uh, all documented on docs to open rewrite.org. Um, so sometimes you can just, really just deploy one of those uh, base recipes and fill out some details. And sometimes, um, you know, you can actually write code to do more complicated things. I think for the case of this, um, this uh, first one, the mutable set dot of, we can just use, we can actually just define um, a YAML file um, uh, for, you know, in the simple cases we can do, uh, you know, sort of basic things. Um, we can uh, define this recipe declaratively and say, we'll call this, uh, you know, migrate uh, no, uh, you know, guava immutable set of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so we'll say use um, set of not guava, right? Um, the description is optional, we'll say that, you know, this is just simply for display. Um, and um, we'll say that uh, we wanna use this change method target to static. Uh, it's one of the base re recipes that are included. And uh, it takes a couple things, it takes a method pattern that helps us identify what we're trying to change. So I think this was conduct Google dot, what was it, immutable set. Um, Google common collect immutable set and the method is of, and there's many different kinds of variants on this. So we'll say, we we'll just wanna capture all of them, uh, any number of parameters. Um, if we look at the sort of options that are on change method target stack, method pattern is one of the options, the fully qualified target type name, the type that we wanna change it to. So this will be java date util dot set. And then the last thing is um, the original guava method returned a guava immutable set, but the Java method actually returns just a regular set. Um, so we'll change the return type as well. Um, so that should be the whole recipe, uh, you know, completely defined. Um, so any, you could pack this in a meta in free write directory in any jar and ship it. And uh, the build tool plugins would be able to pick that up and run that recipe on another repository. Um, one of the really cool things is uh, the sort of the testing harness that we have available to test these kinds of things. So no guava mutable set of We'll write a test for this. And we have a test harness called Java recipe test. And uh, we'll create a uh, replace set of So we're going to say that the recipe we're going to try to run, since this one's a YAML recipe, we're going to actually scan the class path looking for recipes so that'll pick up the yaml files on the class path and then we're going to activate this particular recipe by name the name that we provided here that should be enough and then 
so we kind of we specify the before text and the after text of what we expect to see. Um, and you know, one of the real special things here is that you'll notice that um, we've used an annotation on this method that actually the test code that you're writing here, even though it's in a string, gets syntax highlighted like it's regular Java code. Um, it's pretty special. Um, so maybe you know we had a set of integers here, and we like you know Cardinals World Series wins or something like that. You know, is immutable set um, dot of uh, 2006, 2011. Let's say 2021 as well, right? Uh, and that was the original. That's the this was the original code that we want to change now. So we're going to take this and say, you know, instead I want to see java.util.set. And I just want this to be set out of. And we'll see how this works. Hopefully everything works out. We'll run this one. Mm -hmm. Of course. Oh yeah, we need to the uh, so we ran this before text through a parser, but that parser didn't have access to uh, Guava itself. So we're going to override the parser that the test uses here, and we can build the actual Java parser just detect whatever Java version we have locally. Guava is somewhere on my class path, so I'll let it find that. And then we'll run this again. And that's it. So, you know, this code here was changed into this, you know, here. Um, so that's you know, you could take this YAML file and just ship it, you know, with any given library and then run it with the build tool on uh, the um, remainder of the of any projects that you had. And it would, you know, eliminate this use of Guava immutable set. Um, because this is just a basic building block uh, recipe that comes with open rewrite, um, we could do the same thing actually over here um, we could look at Java and say change method target to static. It's the same thing and just fill out the fields. So we want to change immutable set of to Java util set, Java util set. And that's enough, right? That's um, the most common sort of refactoring cases can leverage these building blocks like this and you get sort of quick quick results uh, right away. So here again, we're running this, you know, brand new thing we just created across 10 million source files. And we'll look at say the diff that it made to the Cerner Bunsen repository here. And here we're, you know, replacing, we're getting rid of immutable set and we're using set. And you can see all over the, case, the place it, that method no longer exists in this repository. So we could take this you know, Cerner Bunsen here and create a PR from it. You know, use Java standard library. And this would create, uh, you know, a fork of the repository, a uh, whole new branch and push up all the changes to it. And then we could go over here to GitHub and just um, you know, can, can commit this result uh, if we wanted to. Um, so I'll stop for a moment uh, before we move on to the next one, because this is maybe a bit to digest. And does anybody have any questions so far or thoughts about what, what you've seen? Don't be shy if you do. Um, 
It's not questions. I was very impressed with what you're showing right now, and I have to learn about this stuff because I've never seen it before. It's very new. Yeah, we're just kind of, uh, you know, just started sharing it not too long ago. So it's, uh, but it, it's a very different sort of thing. Yeah, uh, not just a search, but actually. Uh, well, I have to use something like this on Spring Boot and go to Quarkus, and I have to change all the code because you have to refactor Spring Boot and there's problems because they're using too many classes. And so, yep. and so Spring Boot is understand the database and you can now change it very fast if you knew the classes and everything in Quarkus and now it's very easy to understand it, how you could change it back. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, there's an example of a, I know this isn't quite what you're talking about, but just a Spring Pet Clinic um, migration that um, we could run um, say the, uh, let's see, in spring, we have a bunch of spring best practices things we're developing, like, you know, remove public, you know, this, like this one's a big one, you know, you're not supposed to use uh, request mapping, you're supposed to use the more specific ones, or it represents a vulnerability, actually, but there's a, um, you know, spring boot two migration from one, and uh, maybe we'll just select the pet clinic one here. Uh, and run this one. This repository is plug in like uh, you know um, JPA or Hibernate to a database, and then you can get the classes back. But then you don't want to use uh, all the refactorization, and and you want to refactor it, redo it on Quarkus, and so it's better to use like you know. JPE or all this stuff and change it back to Quarkus and it's easy to mm. understand how you can change the classes very fast. It's yes, nice. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so here you see the, you know, the Spring Boot 2 migration involves a lot of things, changing the parent version, you know, dropping this because it doesn't, not need it anymore. Java X validation is needed now. Um, we want to migrate to JUnit 5 while we do Spring Boot 2 but um, you know, this still has an exclusion that we can add here uh, to get rid of JUnit 4. And then you see all these things like, uh, some of them it's complicated, like you used to have conditional on bean in Spring Boot 1, but now you have to create this any nested condition. And so we generate a whole class with you know, the conditions here named and everything. Um, and again, the change actually just follows the formatting of the original project. So this project, happens to use the four spaces in you know indentation and a particular import format but the project might have tabs or it might have two spaces or you never know what you're going to find so the same change can look very different depending on the project um, here i think you know you no longer need to specify this parameter if the parameter name happens to be the same so we can drop that um, here you know this represents a uh, cross-site uh, scripting vulnerability because you know you can you can send post and delete requests to this sort of thing and you really only intended for it to be open to get um, so you're supposed to change those um, so that's the, some of the sort of things um, sort of higher order things that we can do so if but, you uh, if you have software that you, that can't leave the our local environment yeah how do, how do we how do we deal with that? and use a service like this, that's where, uh, so first of all, today, you could use just the build tool plugins, the Maven or Gradle plugins and apply the recipes and get it, you know, uh, accomplish it that way on an individual basis. But we are, as a company, opening up this, uh, this service to sort of like design partners, we want you to contact us. And we have, you know, increasingly a mechanism to tie private repositories to it. Um, in a sort of single tenant fashion and keep it secret to you. Um, okay. So, yeah, we'd love to, you know, uh, to work with with anybody really that's, uh, you know, interested in this kind of thing afterwards. Uh, but, uh, so I think we have one more recipe we were gonna write. And that recipe again was, uh, I think going back to, um, back to the results here. 
uh, it was, um, I think we were looking at a Cerner repository originally, and we saw that it was using this list.new array list. And so this one, you can't use change method to target the static like we did the other one, because we're actually going to use a, um, a, a, a very different kind of statement. We're going to create a, a new array list rather than making the method call. So for this one, we're going to actually need to write a programmatic recipe. Um, and so we'll do that. I shared the wrong screen here. Um, so for this one, um, we'll go and say, uh, call it something similar, no guava uh, lists new array list. And here we're going to extend the class called recipe. Um, and it requires us to provide a display name. So we're going to say no uh, use you know, new array list instead of guava. And you know we can provide a description here, but I'll leave that off for now. Um, and there's this thing called an applicability test, um, which we use to be able to execute things really fast to say like this recipe would only be uh, applicable if it uses a particular method. And that method is uh, a, um, we're gonna create this. The method that we're uh, trying to target is com, actually I forget what it's called, this one this uh, Google common collect lists. And new array list was the, the way the, the method was called. So this recipe will basically get skipped if the file doesn't have this, uh, this thing. We're gonna use this method pattern again uh, down here. So I'm gonna go ahead and move it up to a final field here, new array list equals method, sorry. Uh, move it up here. It's always hard to type live, you know. Um, so new array list, you know, we're gonna use that. And then we need to implement some visitor that uh, actually does the work. Um, Sometimes recipes don't have anything they do. They just uh, chain other recipes. So when we look at the, the SAS over here, um, if you look at a recipe like uh, JUnit Jupyter best practices, this one just includes other recipes. So it includes the statically import, it includes this thing, and this thing includes a bunch of other recipes that it applies in order to affect the whole change. So you can always just run one of them if you want, you know, to just do one narrow thing, or you could run the whole bundle of them uh, if you want to just kind of do it all at once. Uh, it allows you to sort of, you know, pick pick what you want to do um, depending on the context. Um, so in this case, this recipe is actually going to do some work. So we're going to say this takes this, and the thing that we're trying to change um, is. Uh, it's an actual uh, a method invocation. So maybe it'd be easier if we uh, write the test first. I'm gonna just copy this one. New guava, no guava lists, new array list. And it's similar, we need guava parser. In this case, we're gonna say uh, no guava. Yeah, because that's the recipe that we're executing. Um, similar, but we're gonna say lists. Here we're gonna say list import Java util list. And here we're gonna say lists, new array list. You have to move this window around. Our mouse is jumping all over the place here. There we go. <clears throat> yeah. So that's, that's the before, right? The list on the left side, lists on the right side. And what we wanna see is this and a uh, array list and we just want this to be new array list. So this thing right here, 
is a method call. Um, so over here in our visitor, we're going to say visit method invocation, which is what a method call is. And we're going to say if this method, if this new array list pattern matches the method, then it's something we want to change. Um, now, how do we quickly build up the abstract syntax tree for what we want to change when, you know, we're not really that, like, um, we're not robots, right? We don't really know abstract syntax trees that well. So we have this mechanism called uh, a Java template that allows you to build um, things just kind of in code. Uh, and then it'll build the AST and insert it in the right place. So it looks something like this. This is the code I want to see. And so I want to keep that. And here, I just want to take this method and I want to say method dot, um, I'm, I just want to replace it with a template. So um, I want to say new array list, this, this template I just created. And the thing I want to replace is the method itself. So we have a coordinate system that lets you pinpoint the thing that you want to change. In this case, you want to change the whole method. I just want to replace it. And it doesn't take any parameters. So, you know, I'm just going to, so this will actually get passed to a little miniature Java compiler and it'll turn it into an abstract syntax tree and make it a, insertable into this, this place here. Um, and then there's a couple other things um, that we want to do. Um, we want to remove the old uh, lists uh, import, but only if it's not used anywhere else. Right, like there could be another method call to lists, uh, and sometimes there won't be. So it's fine to just say maybe remove import, and that recipe that's going to get chained to it will check the rest of the file to see whether it's used. And if it isn't, it'll go ahead and remove the import. And I want to, you know, add the import. In this case, I know this one's going to be going to be here, but and then also up here, this Java template, I need to tell it what does array list mean, and it, you know, it it means this, this array list. So I'm going to say that that's, you know, an import as well. And let's see. I don't know if this will this will work, but I think this is pretty close. Um, so we'll we'll I think we've created the parser, we've created the recipe, you know, the, the original thing. Let's see what happens here. Interestingly, I've got a, some unused imports up here. Oh yeah, I forgot to change the left side over here to list. Uh, maybe this is replaced with new array list. A better name. So this will After it builds, and there we go. So that one was replaced, you know, with this new array list. Now I was mentioning that a lot of the stuff is really contextual. So you know, by removing this import and adding another one, what if my project was configured to say, you know, if I have five or more imports from a package, that I should use a, a star import. So maybe let's just import a bunch more of them. Uh, Java util dot map. I don't know. What's another one? Can anyone throw out another one? What's another thing in Java util? Uh, I guess IDE will tell me here. Collections. Date, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, probably hash map. I'm guessing. I'm not sure. Yeah, though. date. Date will work. Yeah. So now we've got four, right? And we're about to add a fifth one, array list. So the default, you know, style, of course, is the IntelliJ style, and you know, you could specify other styles. But in theory, by adding an additional, uh, you know, type here, I should be folding these imports up. And so I'm going to not do that right now and just run the test as is and see what happens. But you know, it doesn't mean that these have to be used. You know, that's what the IDE would do uh, if we were doing this sort of thing. And sure enough, I think what we see is, yeah, it recognized that there was already four. And so when it did the maybe add import, it 
put them in a star instead. And so this would be, you know, what would happen. And the opposite would be true as well, right? If if we had import com Google, what's another thing in this? Common.collect dot immutable set. Yeah. Maybe we if I had an immutable set here. then what I would expect. So maybe I had a star import here, although you know I shouldn't have maybe. And by removing this list, I would expect to see, you know, a uh, just one remaining that this gets unfolded. And so, you know, imagine trying to do something like this with the regular expression, right? It truly is a sort of complicated endeavor. Now, what happened here? Oh, of course, it just put them in a different order because of the, the style. Yeah, it would be like this, you know, normally. Yeah. That's the sort of default style. But, uh, yeah, so it's anyway, hopefully that shows you some of the, 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 you know, the power of what you can do um, with, with the, the framework as it is. Um, I'll um, flip back over to the last slide and then I'm happy to take any questions or we can develop something else or, or anything else that you can think of. Um, so we have a couple, couple asks, you know, as always. Um, We'd love it if you go and, and follow the repo for, with us. Uh, it helps us quite a bit as we talk to investors as well. You know, we're a, a new company and trying to get going. Um, if you, you know, are a Java developer and, and you've seen something like what we did with Glava today, open an issue and say, I wish you could do this, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, just, we'd love to see you open an issue uh, and just give us, one thing that you'd want to see done, and we'll try to get get on that and get it implemented. Uh, we've got our Twitter handle here, and it, we would uh, love it as well if you would try out this UI that we uh, we have uh, been showing tonight. And so to do that, you could go to uh, our website here at modern.io and just Put your email here and we'll we'll give you access to that service so you can try it out and you can when you sign when you come into the service you can ask the service to include any other public repository that's on github um, so that you can play around with that uh, with the recipes and, and and try it out on something um, and that feedback is really helpful to us right now as well um, so that's uh that's the presentation side of it, and now yeah, we're totally open for questions for as long as you have them. I'll be happy to create an issue for you that Thank you. I want to do this because I have to do this tomorrow myself because I have to convert a Spring JPA application to Quarkus mm. JPA because mm. when you understand reflection is not inside of Quarkus. That's why they stripped it. Okay. Yep. And yep. Yep. You have to reverse engineer the database with mm. JPA and get the classes. But mm. then, if the database is too large, it's a re total refactoring problem to strip out mm. all the reflection stuff inside of JPA and therefore get it down to the Quarkus version. Mm -hmm. and therefore, mm -hmm. it would work very easy. And therefore, I'll create an issue and talk about this. Great. Because yeah. It's done very fast. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, and yeah, feel free to, you know, reach out to one of us. Um, we have a Slack channel or, you know, you can hit me up on Twitter or whatever and uh, and we'll hop on a call and just go through it with you too. If we can see what the code before and after looks like, we can usually develop something reasonably well. right well. now I have to put it really honestly, I have to reverse engineer the database first and get the JPA back. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. this is what's going on. They didn't tell yeah. us what the database is. And therefore, hmm. because Quarkus, Quarkus's JPA doesn't have reflection, therefore, it will not work with that. 
way. Mm. And therefore, yeah. you have to get the, get the classes and then strip it out and put it back into Quarkus. Mm. I've done it one time for a very small six table thing and I refactored it myself. But yeah. if I have something like 75, 175 tables, I'm done for. Yeah, yeah I'm done I know. For. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I believe it. I, you know, I, I, I found last year, I, I had wanted to try this for a while, but I, we got to a point where we we're doing these sort of manual tasks like this. And I thought, I wonder if I could, I'm at a point where I could actually listen to a podcast and pay attention while actually doing some code that, like that, you know, that like once you do one thing, it's just tedious, you know, you got to go table, but you know, thing, but then, um, yeah, it's no fun to do that kind of stuff. I know. So. The other thing that we're doing right now, unfortunately, I, I'll talk about it because other people might have to do this. Yeah, yeah. I have to refactor <laughs> uh, serverless from different cloud systems, and therefore mm -hmm. we have to refactor the code to the headers and everything else, the events oh, and everything yeah. like, and therefore we have to refactor it so it would like hopefully work very simply to get everything done correctly. But that's another job that I have to do, like probably next month. And yeah, I'm really yeah. worried about this. And I like your thoughts about this. I really like those thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, and when you're doing a big job like that, one of the things um, I guess we found when we we're doing this at Netflix, some of these things can be really invasive. You know, you're touching a lot of code. And so you start working on it. And then it gets shelved for a little bit because of some other emergency that came up. And when you come back to it, then it's not mergeable anymore. And you have all these conflicts and things like that that you have to work out. And one thing that's nice about developing the recipe is that the recipe can always just be ran against the, the latest head. Um, so even if you pre-created a PR, um, if you can't merge it right now, well, you just force push over the branch later on and you know the PR is up to date with whatever the latest head code is. So it, it allows you to sort of, you know, merge when it's the right time, yeah, you know, even as other priorities come up, uh, it's been pretty helpful, I think, in many cases. So what's the one thing that you would say, this is not really meant for a job like this? Could you give me an example that you said, we looked at it and we were really thinking about it, it's a good idea. And then we got into it and we said, no, I want an example, please. Well, well, some of the things that I, I haven't gotten into because I know it's not a good idea to begin with. Um, I, you know, there was an investor that asked us earlier today, could you migrate a whole material UI UI to some other, you know, uh, I think it was called, I forget what it was even called, but basically, you know, material UI to Twitter bootstrap. And it'd be like, yeah, that would be, that would be a pretty big operation. Um, at the same time, you know, when, when we started the framework uh, at Netflix, we were really just after that single method replacement. And, um, you know, so we started with the change method name or change method target static or whatever it was that there's basic building blocks necessary to make that happen. And the further we go, the more and more and more basic building blocks we have, the easier it gets to make these higher and higher order transformations. It's just like any form of abstraction in code. You start to you know, get more and more sophistication out of it. Um, so, you know, right now I would say I'd be nervous about taking a struts application and migrating it automatically to Spring Boot 2.5. But, you know, in a year, I may think differently about that, um, depending on how many building blocks we've lined up with. So. Really, what would be your major concern about that? Because I've done something like that in the past and Spring Boot- It may very well be thoughts, possible. Yeah. I've done it for an entire like web logic server. And yeah. we took the total ear, we took the total application, we booted it for a Salesforce integration that we did. And that was like, oh, I hate to say it, six years ago. And it mm. wasn't that difficult really to do if you only think about it's just a starter idea. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, yeah. if you keep it, your ideas simple, mm -hmm. I think it's doable and without trying to bite off too much is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And that is the way it tends to be approached. You know, when we went to the JUnit 4 to 5 migration, it's take care of all the assertion statements, the annotations, the 
and then add temp file, temp directory handling, and then this handling, and you know, you sort of, you know, add pieces as you encounter them. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent all the time. Um, but uh, we do have this principle like um, do no harm. So if we make a change, the change is correct. Um, but you know, that's not to say that we'll make every possible change that you know um, that's involved in a migration until somebody points it out and it's needed. Um, so yeah, can I don't know where the limit is. Yeah, go ahead. Can, can you limit the the part of the repository that it changes? Like if you want to do a module at a time. Or do you have to do you have to do the whole repository? Yeah, the um, uh, it, it's one of those things that you saw those applicable tests. Uh, I'll show that again, but uh, we'll actually just do this. Um, is my IDE still alive? Yeah. Um, so there's an applicable test here, and um, you know, uh, so you could add different types of applicability tests. One of them could be this. You know, I could say return um, new Java visitor, uh, say, um, and, and really what an applicability test does here, it's just if you mutate anything about the AST, then it says, yep, this is something to be done. Otherwise, it's, it's not something. So it's a bit weird the way it, it's. And what I'd be looking for here is that cu uh, source path. So we have the actual relative source path inside the directory, okay. you know, dot, I don't know, that contains um, my module source main Java or something like that. And then this would be constrained now to just this one, you know, module uh, with uh, in the main source. Set. And, you know, so that that's, you could write a, just a recipe that just, uh, that all it does is chain a bunch of other recipes. And that chaining looks like, you know, uh, I could say do next, uh, you know, new, I don't know, change method name from, or change type from, you know, X to Y. And I'm saying that this, this recipe I'm writing, I only want it to run on this particular module. So I don't find that that's a very uh, common request necessarily, but uh, yeah, you can, you can sort of uh, do whatever you want um, with these, these applicability tests to limit the search scope. Hopefully that, that answers it. Yeah, I think the other yeah. thing you could do Thanks. easily would be to just let it run on everything and um, you know, get restore everything that you didn't want changed. Um, before yeah. committing. Uh, that's true. I was just thinking, you know, as, as far as a testing in, in a very big system and you kind of had the resources to test a piece at a time. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. So yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. 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 So do you find that if if it if you do the conversion and it compiles cleanly, that there's a low risk of execution errors? Or, or do you still have to or do you worry about just it working right later? Well, it's, you know, I mean, of course that's dependent on the change that you're making. Uh, in the case of, um, you know, this Guava, you know, immutable set to set, um, I'd, be, I'd be confident about that one. You know, there's very little chance that that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. um, then you kind of move up the stack a bit and you think J unit four to five migration. There's certainly more risk that something wouldn't run, but there's, you know, it's also like any code. Uh, the more things we run it on, the more edge cases we see, the more mm -hmm. changes that we make, and it gets more and more and more reliable. So, one thing I, I, I like about the idea of like generating the PR, putting it in the hands of a developer to commit it, is that, you know, somebody's going to review the code ultimately. And it's mm -hmm. really just. You know, trying to take the grunt work out of it. I don't want to have to go through and replace 500 well, files worth of. Yeah, but I mean, you, you you say that somebody's going to review it, but if you go in and bulk change a million line repository and then do a pull yeah. request, are you really thinking somebody's going to look at all those? No, I mean they're going to have to. Yeah, you'd pull it and you run the tests. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then uh, you know, like any other change, you'd. you'd um, yeah, there would be. 
how how well do the tests test <laughs> yeah, mm, the right. thing that you're changing of course um but you know i think your point is valid i mean you know like uh commit to one uh, sub module or sub project and you know and then gradually as your confidence increases in the recipe mm -hmm. uh, get more and more extreme about how you uh how you view that but um it, could the same yeah because the same reaction the happened with the i'm sorry because you can limit the refactoring of the code there's other operations that clients would probably be interested yeah. in only because the fact like yeah. there's unfortunately there's always biases in the java languages that certain things have gotten into it that some java developers really love but then yeah. other managers don't i'll talk about one that now has got a hot spot with my client Arrow functions, mm -hmm. he wants them all to be available, possibly to make public so that they can test it. They want it unit testable. And that's what they're like, not liking about arrow functions. And they are going after it like a fiendish mm -hmm. thing right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just don't want to see that pattern in their code, huh? Well, it's because they want it tested and they're, ha they're having problems right. getting at to the method that is actually running that little piece of code and the developers are saying, well, you know, we can't test everything. We don't have that kind of visibility to see all right. the lanes of where it's going. And therefore, okay, then fix your code. I don't want arrow, get rid of it. I need you to test this. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And therefore there, they're saying it's too much refactoring. And therefore there, there, they're getting rid of it. There are patterns around that, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, you, one of the, one of the things you're bringing up is that your design has a lot to do with how easy you're going to be able to run this cleanly. Yeah. If you've got a very convoluted design or, or things where your patterns aren't consistent throughout a big code base, you know, you're going to have to run it many times probably to find, well, it didn't catch these. Let me go write a new rule to catch mm -hmm. this new thing. Right. Would you, is that, is that true or not? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable the kinds of things. So like the J unit four to five thing or the spring one, two thing changes. I mean, it's, uh, it's, Sometimes, you know, we have like cleanup recipes that do Boolean simplification and uh, uh, just like things that the IDE does that, you know, you say, oh, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. Um, and the more recipes that get added to the pool, um, the more of that just kind of happens. I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced in the IDE, you write a block of code and it says, oh, you could do this. And so you accept the change. And then it says, oh, you could do a further thing. And then you accept the change. Oh, you could do a further thing. And you wind up with code that looks quite a bit different than where you started. Um, and uh, there's a similar dynamic here, which is that when recipes run and make a change, it does another loop through the run. And it says, you know, is there anything else that would change now that I see that this code has changed in that way? And so it just, it runs potentially multiple cycles. Um, so you could see a scenario where you, you do like this, you know this you know uh, add and remove okay. imports so and then you order imports later and then you and run clean up and you know so you know I mean? there's like progressive simplification that happens but yeah it's uh and again the more the more base building blocks we build the more sophistication i think goes into that yeah. so for, the, for, for those kind of error those kind of changes like clean up your imports or uh, you know or, or even even using arrows differently Mm -hmm. Isn't that since the IDE IntelliJ does such a good job of doing that already and making suggestions, isn't it easier to just when you have the code open as a process go through the IntelliJ and just alt enter and accept all those and get it done once versus the power of this seems like like you say Java four to or sorry J unit four to five, it, it's just a lot of a lot of just grunt work and tedious change in order of, of parameters. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll find it's a mixture. I mean, I, what, I, what I've observed is that there's a lot of code that isn't actively worked on. And even the code that we actively work on, we tend to open a single file at a time. And then you maybe see something that ID suggests mm -hmm. to you, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you changed that. And then, you know, so it just kind of... But like, I guess if you're not touching it for so like the, the order of the imports until you touch it, do you care? Yeah, it's true. Um, it's, you know, it's about the, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's aesthetics, but do you look at it 
it's not it's no it's Schrodinger's cat you know it's 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 crap and it's perfect all at the same time yeah <laughs> that's fair yeah. Schrodinger's yeah. code right so yeah yeah we do I do think you see you know developers tend to copy what they see elsewhere so mm -hmm. um you know if you've got a pattern that you you know it's a sort of like architect level person in an organization if you said I no longer want to see this um the probably quickest way to stop seeing it is to actually get rid of the occurrences of it um, and uh and then, and yeah. then it'll stop you know reproducing itself but uh yeah yeah but it, to me to me that's more things like lack of polymorphism lack of proper inheritance hierarchies that this wouldn't catch you know i i, I want to see open close principle I'm, I'm not as concerned about personally about the order of the import statements Right, yeah, but if I, if you've got open close okay. designs, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another, you know, there's another. Uh, let's let's run another one as a, as an example. Sometimes not quite a framework migration level thing, but is, uh, it, you know, is, is something I would be concerned about um, generally. Um, like like this old old one here. Um, you know, where you have uh, like XXC vulnerabilities. And sometimes we don't know about these things up front, right? Um, like they, um, you know, some splashy CVE hits the wire and, you know, it's, I don't know, where is it? Well, um, you know, so this Intuit repository, um, you know, was constructing an uh, XML factory and didn't, didn't, uh, and was using it in an insecure way because the, you know, unfortunately the default new instance XML input factory is insecure by default. Um, and there's been a lot of like hand wringing about it shouldn't be, but then there's gonna be a backwards compatible, you know. So, um, you know, that's the kind of thing, like I would have to go open the IDE on every single project that I have, even if I had that sort of recipe, you know, it isn't, it isn't a whole framework migration, but this is a pattern I never wanna see again in my code and i would run that somewhat consistently to, yeah that's fair. Urge it. yeah yeah um so uh i think paul was asking um you know the plug and run recipes uh i have 125 spring boot microservices where i'd like to say include and apply the helm plugin across it. maybe paul you could uh speak a bit more to uh to what you're uh what you're asking there Is this, you, you're looking for the uh, remediation of uh, Gradle build scripts themselves? Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. things like, you know, upgrading, uh, you know, a plugin version or something and then, uh, or yeah. in our case too, you know, we have a custom plugin that we've created for Gradle that creates a Helm chart for uh, Kubernetes deployment. So it's one of those things where we, as we change things or if we change things, we can say, hey, did this Helm stanza go ahead and, you know, add new attributes or update them or something. So, yeah, one of the the sort of a historical uh, uh, antecedent to the things we've been seeing today is actually this um, this Gradle Lint plugin, mm. and so this goes back to 2015, um, or a lot of the Netflix code base was Gradle, um, and yeah, this is just like how on earth do we try to impose some standard on right. gro arbitrary groovy code. Um, and so this actually is AST manipulation as well uh, in, in Gradle files. It does things like, you know, dependency rule, all, you know, it, it, it doesn't do everything, ah. but there's quite a few things out there. Um, the way I see it, um, we, we have to develop a groovy AST and, a, and eventually a Kotlin AST, and then we'll layer the Gradle AST on top of the groovy, just like we've layered Maven on top of XML. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I think when we do that, and I've done some early exploratory work on this, one of the things that Gradle Lint plugins struggle with is that, of course, Groovy is a dynamic language. So you, when you see the word dependencies, it's like, I don't know if you mean dependency handler or if you mean some other <laughs> method call here. Um, it, so that's tough. Um, uh, Cedric uh, years ago wrote a static compiler for Groovy, uh, but you have to have the compile static annotation on things for that to actually run. 
And what I've noticed is when we actually get a Groovy AST back from the Groovy compiler, um, we can actually force that static compilation visitor to run and it type attributes a lot of the Gradle AST as well. Um, so anyway, when we when when I finish that up, that Groovy AST and layer a Gradle one on top of it, I think we'll have a very rich model uh, upon which to perform uh, Gradle refactoring, like dependency updates and plugin updates and things like that as well. Or to yeah, like you say, apply a plugin across all the repos because yeah, Gradle lacks the sort of uh, parent model that Maven has. Um, so yeah, that'd be a fun thing to to work on with you. Yeah, when, no, that's kind of that's really cool though. Yeah. Um, so what else uh, is out there? Any other uh, any other thoughts from anyone else? Yeah, I got a question. What if, sure. what if there's a, it may not be true for immutable sets, or it's Java util dot sets. But what if there's an operation on the the immutable sets that you or in fact you want immutability and there are there's a method call on the immutable sets that doesn't exist on set. Mm -hmm. or there exists or you have to change the name of it. How do you go about scouring that or is that just brute effort of brewing the libraries and making sure that the methods are not only name equivalent and most of the time they work the same and all but all the edge cases are also the same yeah i mean i think that's what i don't think there's any shortcuts you know and and so sometimes you'll hear people thinking about static analysis so like ai is going to automatically discover api differences is like i don't think this is something we want. This isn't a world we want to live in. What what I, I think is that um, we all use the same set of things, like uh, across the Java ecosystem. Like a lot of us use Guava or Commons collections libraries or this API and Spring and you know, sort of collectively together. I think we can build up a, a recipe trove that would do many of the things that are important to all of us. Um, the uh, specific question about, um, you know, whether you change a type from one thing to another, and then is, is the, uh, you know, maybe it's a different name uh, on the other uh, type. I think I've got an example of this. Um, looking for it, but um, let's see. Uh, I don't know. Um, I thought we had an example in rewrite testing firms, but anyway, you can sometimes build um, recipes that even declaratively that do two or more things at once. Um, here's here it is. Uh, the uh, you know we have a situation where we're changing. Um, Makito mock or uh, matchers argument matchers these two go together actually matchers argument to uh, argument matchers and then any virarg to any so these two recipes together will effectively change matchers any virarg to argument matchers any but yeah I mean that's this was you know taken out of the release notes for Makito it said you know you need to migrate this to this. Um, and so we look at that release note. I would have done it manually. Instead, I just whipped up a quick, you know, declarative recipe and then we're off to the races. Yeah. We've actually run into this with the uh, JUnit 4 to 5 migration. Assert that exists in JUnit 4, but doesn't exist in JUnit 5, though. You were changing the assert to assertions, but those methods didn't exist. So it's just something that as the community uh, gets involved, we start running into these kind of edge cases and then we just go and fix the recipes so that they you know, perform properly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What else have you got? Any other, like uh, anybody else uh, like, uh, ha you know, have a sort of like a, a project they're working on right now where they're trying to change one thing to another and or like do away with a you know a particular pattern. 
I'm interested for your from your uh, stress to spring boot thing. So I'm waiting for that year. I'm going to call you on that. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I got a real old app that is in stress that is business critical and uh, mm. need to get it to something not stress. So it'd be interesting to see how that could be done incrementally, you know, um, yeah. like what would that look like? Um, we were talking with uh, one of our design partners recently. They had an app in like, um, I don't know if it was struts, but like it used the old Jack's RS annotations and they wanted to move to spring boot but it's like the first thing i could do is just replace jacks rs you know request annotations with spring web mvc annotations and add the correct dependency and then like you see you just kind of like move little by little you know towards something that looks more modern but mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i mean and if you've done these things before and you've you know done a, a, a migration from one thing to another i think that's the experience of a developer who's been there before. It's like, what were the steps that you took um, to get there? Yeah, I'd be really interested in uh, yeah. this spring J JPA to Quarkus. You know, you've done it before. Yeah. What are the steps that you took? Yeah, and if you've done it before, you probably have done so many just rote changes that you've got to memorize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think Tyler, who's here, did the Java 8 to 11 migration before and has a lot of scars from it. So when it was like, okay, I, I know what it means to migrate from Java 8 to 11, we were able to build that one. And, and is that is that a, you, you have a predefined set of recipes for that? We do, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, so that and, one is. And those are free too, right? I mean, that's part of your. Yeah, the, the every every recipe we'll ever develop will be that way um, because it, it's really just about you know so migrate Java eight to eleven, um, do it on everything I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's of course there's a lot of pieces to this, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can just. And I guess that you're 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 basing your your business plan on consulting to help companies do this. Not so much consulting, but uh, like uh, hooking up all the private repositories across an organization so you can perform these kind of changes en masse, you know, okay. and, and be done with it. And then track a change to completion and see that it never comes back. And, you yeah. know, next time, um, a, you know, a splashy CVE comes out, um, what, what is the production surface area of that vulnerability in your organization? Okay. Um, and so part of the technology as well is about, um, so what we would like to see ultimately is that as you know, as part of your CI step, you apply the rewrite plugin and it publishes an AST to the service on every build. And so I always have an updated copy of what, you know, what the code looks like, but also at build time, inject a little piece into the application that on a running instance could call home and say, this is what's inside. Of me. This is the okay. AST that's, that's inside of me. So you think about that, say like that solar wind breach earlier this year, it was a CI system uh, exploit that introduced additional code into the application that right. would have also been in the AST actually. So now that that becomes known, I can say, this is the search pattern I'm looking for in the AST, iterate over all your production assets. Here's your vulnerable footprint. Um, mm -hmm. And I think for most of us, we had really no idea. Um, you just had to rebuild everything uh, realistically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, I think that's never kind of, any, there's never any billable materials inside of these systems when you actually download right. from either Microsoft or IBM yep. or Oracle. And that's the real, real vulnerability that I think every system has when you right. saw solar winds, because yep. someone exploited something that had the total weakness because mm -hmm. they turned off all of the agents that would sense what solar winds was doing anyway because it was supposed to intrude into a network yeah. and therefore it was the perfect piggyback to stick a vulnerability into it but mm -hmm. now when you see how government contracts are changing right now yeah. now they want a billable materials and who wrote it all the way down mm -hmm. to who the coder was and yep. now they're going to pay like even like two three even as much as five percent more to get that type of vote visibility right. into mm -hmm their contracts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it's not library level, right? It's code level. It's that that's I, I think ultimately all the way down, all the way down yeah. to who wrote it. Yeah. 
Where did it, you know, was it written in Russia? Was it written in Vietnam? Who were the developers? What's their names? At least what, what's their ID on the system? Because that's really what they're looking for because they want to find out where it was because I've had to work on um, different utility companies because they lost like $10 million because they didn't know who wrote the system. And someone actually was hired in from offshore who came in, wrote some code and basically found a way to rewrite the check system. So they wrote five checks for a total of $5 million, $10 million. Yeah. Skipped town on the day they all got checked, cashed. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Schnucks vulnerability was a lot like that, too, inside work that you couldn't track. Mm. You know, when Schnucks had its breach a few years ago. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And so that's, you know, we had, uh, it's, it's part of, we had tied these ASTs to the deployed asset inventory uh, at Netflix, and we could do that kind of analysis of, like, just iterate over the production assets and where is this code pattern. Uh, but I think that was a really unique capability. Um, as far as I've seen there. Um, and, that, and I'd like to bring that to a larger audience as well. Um, but yeah, as far as recipes go, I, I do think they should, they should always be Apache licensed. Uh, we're working with the Spring team on developing some uh, recipes from legacy Java EE apps to Spring. We're working with the Quarkus team a little bit now. Um, you know, we think ultimately we want framework authors to pack a recipe you know, when Spring Boot 3 comes out, I want there to be a recipe inside of Spring Boot 3 that migrates you from Spring Boot 2. Uh, that's the sort of ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, good discussion. Anybody else uh, have anything? I know there's been a lot of folks that have been quiet uh, as well here. Don't be shy. Okay. I'm not uh, really I, hearing anything. I got one, Bruce, real quick. Oh, so, go ahead. so Jonathan, if we want to get a hold of you uh, about some of this, uh, yeah. where's your contact information? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat here. Um, you know, it's, uh, you can, yeah. I've still got the good old St. Louis number here. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, hit me on Twitter. Any of those things will be, uh, will work out pretty well. So, okay. Or you take can, old fashioned email. I take old fashioned email. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, that'd be great. Yeah. So, and Thanks. if you're getting any of these things, just, you know, you can reach us on modern.io. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, turn it back over to you, Bruce. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. And I think at this point, we'll see if we can go ahead and do the raffle. I'm going to click the stop recording button here, right here.